Thank you all very much for coming. It's nice to see so many people who are interested in what's going on and what's going to happen on October the 19th. And a special welcome to the four candidates who all agreed to, uh, to meet with us this afternoon. The first speaker, according to the draw, is, is Bob Jumpman. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me here. It's um, a beautiful green environment, so I feel right at home here. <laughs> I've been um, involved in politics since about 2007. It was the uh, 2007 Ontario referendum of proportional representation that first got me started. Uh, back in the day there, I was just uh, going out, putting up a few signs. Um, but over time, over, uh, over the years, I've gotten more and more involved in that particular issue, uh, to the point where I'm now um, a co-chair on the executive board of Fair Vote Waterloo Week. This year, uh, I was approached by the Green Party to, uh, to run this election because, as you know, the riding split. Kitchen and Conestoga ended up giving off part of the uh, area to Kitchen and South Hestler. And our candidate, uh, David Weaver, ended up going down to Kitchen and South Hestler and forming uh, the EDA there with all the EDA members from what used to be Kitchen and Conestoga. <laughs> so um, I'm new at this and, uh, and very pleased to be able to represent the Green Party there. Although proportional representation is, is the issue that probably strikes me as one of the most important issues in this election, it's a foundational issue. Everything else that the Green Party stands for is better off by having a proportional representation in Parliament so that um, all the views from across the party, across the spectrum, is actually being represented in the way that people voted. But what I'm actually finding is that the most important issue is probably poverty, poverty and social justice and, and peace. Those are the things that I wouldn't have attributed to the Green Party initially. Uh, everybody thinks the Green Party is about the environment. But I'm finding that the Green Party has a, a wide range of policy, uh, a very large platform, uh, which includes certainly the environment and, and the idea behind uh, controlling climate change, uh, reducing the, uh, the carbon footprint, um, having a true cost associated to carbon extraction, but also social justice platforms. And, and I, I'm finding that um, that's receiving a lot of attention from the groups where I've been asked to, uh, to speak. Um, the, the community here in, in Kitchener Conestoga is, is extremely diverse. I mean, we've got um, a huge rural area, the three townships, Woolwich, Wilmot, and, uh, and Wellesley. But we've also got a, a significant chunk of uh, Kitchener, everything that's west of Fisher Hallman Road, uh, uh, an urban riding there. So the, the two communities, the two separate areas are, um, are diverse, but probably united in that they don't want to have a marginalized portion of their community. And I think that the Green Party is certainly uh, well able to address that. Um, hopefully during the, uh, the course of the afternoon we'll uh, get into some of the actual specific uh, parts of the platform. Probably the most important thing on the Green Platform is the guaranteed livable income, uh, which guarantees everybody um, a portion of income that's enough to live on, enough to survive on, so that nobody has to live on the streets, so that nobody has to do without food. And I think that that has actually turned out to be probably the, the biggest thing that um, I'm, I'm pushing for in, in my campaign here, is equality and, and social justice and peace. Thank you very much. Uh, the second speaker is Harold Albrecht. Thank you, Don. Thank you uh, for your hospitality today, and thank you to the volunteers who put this event together. On October 19, you will all have the opportunity to help choose your area's representative to Ottawa. My name is Harold Albrecht, and for almost a decade, I've had the distinct honor of serving as your member of Parliament. During that time, I've had the privilege of passing legislation to prevent deaths by suicide. I've helped raise funds when New Hamburg was flooded. I've enjoyed attending every community event I could fit into my schedule. I've drawn immense personal satisfaction when I'm stopped by someone who tells me how helpful my staff have been in resolving an issue. So for me, the most important issue at stake in the upcoming election is area of representation for the village of, for the community of Kitchener, Conestoga. Your help and support has enabled me to serve you. And under the proven leadership of Prime Minister Stephen Harper, Canada has been an island of stability in a very unstable global economy. Our GDP and our employment growth have led the world. We haven't had it easy, but our low tax plan has worked. 
In every way the federal government takes money from individuals, we are taking less. Income taxes, customs and excise fees, the GST, we have reduced taxes in every way possible. And we did that through the toughest global economy since the Great Depression. And returning the budget to surplus <coughs> to me, a year ahead of schedule. Prime Minister Harper made a choice. Instead of slashing and burning our health care system like the previous government, or allowing spending deficits to spiral out of control like the last Trudeau did. Instead, our Prime Minister has chosen disciplined spending. Temporary infrastructure investments that help to build the Wilmot Recreation Center and walking trails and renew the Shade Street Bridge. Targeted support for people working, like the job share program to save jobs right here at Ontario Drive and Gear and keeping your taxes down. You may hear my opponents criticize the fact that Canada ran some deficits, but you won't hear them say that not only were their parties in, fa in favor of those deficits, they were actually demanding larger deficits. Even they don't want to remember that, <coughs> I'm sure that we all do. But we're here to discuss our shared future. We're the only party before you in this election promising no new debt and no new taxes. The New Democrats have suddenly been converted to a belief in balanced budgets but still view taxes as a solution to our problem. The Liberals, in the same breath, attack us for running deficits while promising more deficits, $10 billion a year in deficits, regardless of how the economy is performing. The only certainty with Justin is increased debt. They've promised to find the money they need to balance the budget by closing tax loopholes, but they won't tell you what those loopholes are. Income splitting, pension splitting, who knows? They did mention increasing taxes on small business owners because Trudeau says too many of them are tax cheats. Friends, we don't need more debt. We don't need higher taxes. Higher taxes will not improve our economy. They'll only take more money out of your pocket. Higher debt won't improve our economy. It's just a tax deferred to our grandchildren. Since 1990, Canadians have paid more than $1 trillion in interest payments. A trillion dollars that did not go to health care or international assistance, or into any one of the areas that so desperately need funding. We want to reduce Canada's debt. The Liberals want to increase it, and it's that simple. We have a plan to create 1.3 million net new jobs over five years. Justin has a plan to create $40 billion in increased debt. It's that simple. We look at small business as the engine of our economy, and are looking to them to create jobs. Justin looks at them as a tax scheme, and why wouldn't he? He registered a small business to collect money from charities for the speeches he delivered while sitting as a member of parliament. It's that simple. On October 19th, vote to reduce your debt, vote for 1.3 million net new jobs, vote for proven leadership on our economy. My name is Harold Albrecht, and I need your help to keep Canada on the road to prosperity. On October 19th, we can help keep Canada strong. Thank you, Harold. The next speaker is Tim Lewis. Thank you, John, and thank you guys for taking the time for a fantastic afternoon. Um, when asked the reason, the primary reason I'm running, the first words that come to mind are to restore a fair and open government. That's what got me involved into politics. Can't hear? A little louder, can Oh, air conditioning, gotcha. All right, anyway, over the last 10 years, Stephen Harper, <clears throat> under his watch, we watched the political landscape erode. Uh, and I just felt the frustration of a government that seems to focus only on its ideology and not what's best for all Canadians. And that's just not the same values that I had come to love about Canada. So for me, it's about values. Running for office is not a calling, uh, not sorry, not a career move. It's actually a calling for me because I'm a full-time musician. And I think out of all the candidates, this is the first time I'm running for office. If you talked to me a few years ago and said, do you see yourself running for office? I would have said no. Successful full-time musician, singer, songwriter. Uh, I record a number of albums. I uh, support my wife and two children as a musician. I won the Waterloo Region Awards uh, Musician of the Year Award. So I was very happy uh, doing what I'm doing, but I became increasingly frustrated with the, uh, with the Harper Conservatives. They just seemed to erode democracy. And uh, I made the mistake of complaining to my wife too much, who <laughs> said the now famous line for me, I want you to stop complaining and do something about it. So, so that's when I decided to step forward, take action, and run for office. Because uh, I believe that Canada can be more and that uh, politics can be done differently. It should be uh, not about attacking opponents. It should be about debating ideas. 
And I think that's something that a lot of Canadians want. Uh, over the past year and a half, I've knocked on thousands, thousands of doors all across our riding, and, uh, and people are saying that families have to work harder and harder and harder just to make ends meet. And we're becoming a society of haves and have-nots, and I just don't think that's fair. So the liberal plan to grow that middle class is one of our top priorities. So what it comes down to is we're faced with choices. We've got smart investments and growth, or cuts and austerity. We're faced with an open and transparent government, or the current Harper government, that has a narrow and meaner vision of this country. And I'm not willing to accept that narrow and meaner version, and I hope that you're not willing to accept it either. Uh, working tirelessly for the last year and a half to get this far so we can have this conversation. I'm, I'm very proud of the work myself and all my volunteers have done. Working harder in the next few weeks. We've got three weeks from today, not that anyone's counting here. <laughs> I just want to send a clear signal to Canadians that we are listening to your voice, that I am listening, that the Liberal Party is listening to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, James, you're the last speaker this time. I'm the last this time around. <laughs> I'm James Villeneuve. I represent Tom Mulcair and the NDP. Uh, a little bit about myself. I've served as an officer of my local for 16 years. I'm a sheet metal worker by trade. Uh, I've served 14 years on the Health and Welfare and Pension Trust Fund for my members as well. Time after time, they voted me back into office. Uh, they have faith in me, they believe in me. Uh, governance that we do at the local level in our union, not just from what goes on in Parliament Hill, uh, except we do it on a smaller scale. We debate things, we come to an agreement, we either vote something in or we vote it down. Uh, what brings me here today, uh, I can tell you a little story about uh, my mother, she's 93 years old. She still lives on her own. She has her own apartment. She doesn't have a nurse carrier or anything like that coming in to take care of her. Friday, 10 o'clock in the morning, she phones, leaves me a message on my cell phone with a grocery list and how much money she needs for the week. Saturday, I deliver. Uh, as busy as I am, I still deliver. With her story, it's important to know that Seniors need to be taken care of. Uh, at 93 years old, I did her taxes for her. Uh, she had to pay $1,200 on less than $26,000 income at 93 years old. I was, I, was, I was not impressed. I was actually, I was probably just as upset as she was. Two months later, she gets a letter in the mail from the government of Canada cutting her off of her guaranteed income supplement because her income was too high, at less than $26,000 a year. I have links to her bank account, and I know what she has. Sometimes when I buy her groceries, I don't transfer the money from her account to my account, because it's not there, and it doesn't feel right. Tom's plan is to bring forward increases to the Canada Pension Plan and a guaranteed income supplement to raise 200,000 seniors out of poverty. The people that built Canada, as far as I'm concerned, they deserve better. We're going to bring it to you. On October 19th, you have a choice. You can choose for change, or you can stay the same. Thank you. Well, thank you, James, and thanks to all the candidates. Uh, I want to start off the questions with one that I received uh, this morning by email from Jack Kolechny, who really wanted to be here today, but his duties kept him downtown. But I think it's an interesting question. Jack says that, uh, I believe that a spirit of cooperation and mutual respect among those of differing points of view exists deep within the fiber of Canadians. We could all do better if we work together to find common solutions. The increased partisanship and contempt of other parties and levels of government that we have seen in recent years has been a scandal that has caused many people, especially young people, to be cynical and discouraged, even to the point of choosing not to vote in this election. So the question for our candidates is, if you are elected as the next MP for this riding, what will you do personally to end political rancor and commit to the common good of Canadians? I said you were the last. Now you're the first. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, again, I'd have to go back in reference to the things that I do as a president of my local union uh, when we have memberships our members coming into the office and they start to get upset about things. We have an executive board that sits down together. Uh, they all have their own different, different opinions. And what we do is we sit down at the table and we work and we work and we work until we come to some kind of amicable, amicable solution to the issues that are brought forward from the membership. Uh, same thing at Parliament Hill. I will work with the other parties. Uh, I think that we should work together to create a society in Canada that favors <coughs> all the Canadians. Thank you. Now let's just go right down the table. Bob, next please. One of the things that really draws me to the Green Party is that the respect that the Green Party has for not just its members, but for the House of Parliament in general. Uh, there is a policy, a philosophy, that the Green Party will not heckle in the House of Commons. The Green Party will treat young members <coughs> with respect something that I don't think has been stated expressly by any of the other parties or any of the other members of Parliament necessarily. Um, Elizabeth May has several years on her own have been voted best parliamentarian, um, best speaker uh, in, uh, on, on the floor of the House of Commons. Um, and that's with good reason, because she will not heckle, she will sit down when she's being heckled, and this is one of the ways that we can return respect to the House of Commons. As far as inter-party cooperation goes, um, Elizabeth May has been heard many times to say that we are willing to work across all party lines to do what is best for Canadians. And certainly I can follow along with that um, because I want to do what is best for Canadians as well. Um, there's a lot of good ideas across the table here, and I'm not one to deny any bad, any good idea. Perfect time. Tim, please. <laughs> uh, Excuse me. You heard it in my opening remarks. That's that's extremely important to me. Is working across party lines. That the hyper partisan part of is, is what has got us this, to this situation. This this lack of cooperation. A government just seems focused on their own ideology. Um, that's certainly something that can be fixed. I think it can be fixed across party lines. I also think it can be fixed across between federal, provincial, and municipal. Those lines are open too. Having a, a, a leader who is saying we will work with. The provinces and talk to them. We will work with and meet with the Federation of Municipalities. That's extremely important. And, and on a personal level, as a musician, listening and cooperating and working with is what I do for a living. That's going to be second nature to me. I have no problems with that. Thank you. Harold, please. Oh, thank you for the question. I've had the privilege of working across party lines on a number of significant issues over the last 10 years. The one probably that comes to mind most quickly is my work across party lines on the uh, issue of palliative care, suicide prevention, and elder abuse. Uh, we called together a group of three parliamentarians from the NDP, Liberal, and Conservative. I co-chaired that group. We thought we'd do about a six-month study into palliative care needs in Canada. It ended up being an 18-month study going across Canada, listening to people in virtually every area of Canada, and having a number of round tables in, in Ottawa. And at every one of those meetings, colleagues from all parties sat together. What you see on TV and question period is not where most of the work of Parliament gets done. Most of the work of Parliament gets done in committee and in these cross-party avenues, even if it's an ad hoc group like the palliative care group I'm just referring to. So we produced a report called Not To Be Forgotten with many recommendations. It has received widespread uh, distribution through the <laughs> health ministers all across Canada, premiers of Canada, and we, I can say at this point that a number of the recommendations that we've made in that report, cross-party lines, has been adopted by our government and implemented. My question to you is, and I'd like everybody to respond, how does Canada pay its bills if nobody pays taxes? Well, I, th I think we all, we all agree that taxes are necessary. We want to just minimize them. Certainly, to continue to increase levels of taxes would not improve our economy. In fact, by reducing business taxes, the rate of business tax, we've actually increased the amount of tax coming into the federal coffers. The dollar for dollar amount is up, even though the percentage on those small businesses has dropped uh, from 13 to 11, and we're committed to dropping it to 9% over, uh, over the next two years. So to reduce taxes doesn't always mean you get less money coming into the federal treasury. 
Back to the issue of the TFSA, TIFSAs, where you can put that money aside, certainly no one is suggesting that that money would stay in those, in those avenues. It would be reused for a project, you could put it aside for a few years, you could buy a car or to do a major home renovation. That money will eventually be returning back in the economy. Okay. Uh, I think there's only one party that wants to raise the TFSA. I think it's kind of analogous to buying votes. There's a very small population that can use that. There's a small population that's even maxing out at 5,000 right now. It's, it's not smart politics. It's, actually, it is politics. It's not smart. Um, it just doesn't make sense. You need to invest in Canada. You don't need to just keep cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting because you see where that leads you. You see after 10 years of cuts, all of the cuts that so many play so many, I can't even begin to say the, the vets, the, the science, uh, industry, infrastructure, that's these cuts have led us. We need to fix this country. So I absolutely agree with you. There's only one person at this table who doesn't agree. I'm um, not speaking for you. I'm no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with them then. There's some cross party cooperation. Uh, TFSAs are actually a good vehicle at a fairly low level. So the current level is, I think, $5,500 for, uh, for the cap on that. Um, there are a lot of people who can't even contribute at that level. So a good portion of Canadians are unable to take advantage of those tax breaks. Um, I can certainly see leaving TFSAs at the current level, but I would not at all be um, uh, agree with raising them to any uh, higher level of that. As far as business taxes go, um, Canada of, I think, the top 17 OECD countries has the lowest business tax rate um, across the world. So um, while that sounds good, it sounds like that might attract business to come here, what I have actually seen in Kitchener-Waterloo is companies leaving uh, Kitchener-Waterloo. So the lower tax rates, the tax reductions for businesses have not helped retain jobs here in Kitchener-Waterloo at all. Uh, so for that reason, um, I'm in favor of increasing the large business taxes back to a, a level of about uh, 10 years ago, to uh, a level of 19%. Currently it's about 14 or 15%. Used to be 26% 15 or 20 years ago. And uh, I'd much rather see large taxes raised than small business taxes going up. James. Thank you. With the tax-free savings account, uh, we're not going to hide it. It's not going to go up. It's going to stay at the level that it's at. Uh, you have three at the table that agree that raising it doesn't benefit a majority of the Canadians. Uh, the money that's put into those accounts isn't taxed. It's a tax shelter for the wealthy. Uh, Tom does not agree with it. NDP does not agree with it. Uh, with respect to the increases to corporate taxes uh, from 15% to 17%, which is still lower than what it was uh, when the Conservatives took office that is going to generate funding to support some of our programs. Uh, loopholes that are in the uh, top 15% of Canadians with respect to stock options and uh, increases in their, uh, uh, I'm missing the word now, it's, it's with, with respect to their stock options, uh, they'll be taxed on that as well. and. Harold's plan with the small businesses, he said two years, it's actually four years. NDP's plan is two years in reduction for small business from 11% to 9%. We are going a percent a percent. Conservatives were going a half a half a half a half. Thank you. Sal Grant? <coughs> I would like to speak to Mr. Oldrick on this. Um, just like to mention, of the past few years, I have written to your office and I've always had an answer, so I appreciate that. My question is about immigration. We've all seen on the TV these days hundreds of thousands of people that are fleeing their countries because they want a better life for their children. And I expect that Canada will bring some in. However, my question is this. How does the government go about checking into the background of these people when they're homeless to make sure we do not get people in Canada that would do us harm. Thank you, uh, thank you for that question. I'm not sure <clears throat> thank you for the question. Um, like my opponents here, and like I think everyone in this room, we do want to have a compassionate system that welcomes people from areas of the world uh, where they're undergoing intense persecution and actually are, are targeted. 
But unlike my opponents, um, many of them are, don't seem to be concerned about the security issue. And I feel it's one of the issues we need to be vigilant on. Uh, to simply open the doors to everyone who, who needs help right now, uh, I think would be irresponsible without adequate checks and balances to be sure that we are, first of all, allowing the people in who need it the most, and secondly, to be sure that those people will not present a threat to, uh, to affect to our country. So uh, I personally have had uh, refugees living in my home. I have a heart for refugees. I've helped them find jobs. I've helped them get over the coverage uh, and, and buy a home. But it takes probably a year to walk with a new refugee family who comes into Canada to help them become accustomed to our, our practices here and to help them find the resources that I've just listed and, and to just open up our doors to an inordinate amount of refugees without thinking about what are the implications in terms of security here. I think Germany right now is experiencing some of the backlash to, to not giving that adequate thought and I think we need to be balanced in our approach on that. Thank you. Any of the others care to comment on that? Canada used to be known as a compassionate country. That's no longer the case. There's a report released, released just last week that says Canada has lost its standing in the international community for lack of compassion, for having become a warmongering country in, in the Middle East, uh, and for not taking in refugees. There's a, a promise by the Conservatives to take in 10,000 refugees <coughs> over four years, but at this point we have not taken in any. Our, our refugee intake is zero at this point from the, uh, the current Syrian crisis. Compare that to a, a small country like Lebanon, which is actually right in the middle of, of the zone there, that has, has taken in over a million refugees from Syria. Now, granted, they're right next door, and it's a much shorter path to get there. Um, but I think Canada is, is easily capable of taking in, my guess is around 40,000 refugees a year, uh, without causing a, a great deal of hardship on any of the communities, on uh, any of our tax burdens. and it will show the compassion that, that Canada has for the international community. At uh, 40,000 refugees a year, we'll only see maybe a few hundred in uh, Chinakana, and in every other community across Canada. Tim, please. Yeah, uh, governing by fear is just not working. Uh, no one has said we would not do adequate checks. It, it can be done, it has been done in the past, it's been done for decades. Canada was known as someone who brought over Hungarians, the Vietnamese, both people. It can be done. Other countries are stepping up and we're not. And it, it truly is an embarrassment. And it's just a lack of will and, and then fear to try and get us to be scared. Uh, it can be done safely. It can be done quickly. It can be done compassionately. Harold has asked for 30 seconds to respond. You, you, oh, James, sorry. I apologize. Oh, no, keep your I got my thought. <laughs> Go ahead, Harold. I don't want you to lose it. Just to be fair, uh, the Canadian government has welcomed over 25,000 refugees from Syria and Iraq already to this point, and we're committed to welcoming another 20,000. But what I don't understand is how these parties can sit here and talk about welcoming refugees, but not lift the finger to try to solve the problems that's creating these refugees in the first place. The liberal doctrine of the responsibility to protect, where is that at this point? We have a responsibility to those who are still in Syria and Iraq and Iran so that they're not targeted in the first place. Just bringing refugees is not the answer. I've sat down with many of these people, families, that, that they have families here. They say, we don't want to bring our family members here. They don't want to come here. What we want is you to come to our country and give us a sense of security so we can continue living where we've always lived. They have no interest in coming thousands and thousands of miles just to escape what should be an area that should be safe if we would stand up as an international community and do our job to protect it. James? It's just a quick comment on the, the issue of, of security and background checks on immigrants that are coming through. It's, I, I don't understand how you could say that the other parties wouldn't be interested in protecting our borders by doing that. It's a, it's a government office that does the security and the background checks on these people coming through our borders, families uh, wanting refugee status in Canada. Uh, if the government changes on October 19th, that office does the same job. They don't change. It's not like, it's not like one of the other parties is going to get rid of that security office and bring in a new security office. It remains the same. The background checks are done the way they are to protect Canadian citizens and to give refugees the safety and security that they want on Canadian soil. Thank you. Derek President, please. 
I'd just like to make a comment on the refugee. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked with um, Mary Jo Lenny at Romero House, who specializes in uh, refugees, and um, our worshiping community also put forward to sponsor a refugee family from Syria, and we still haven't got it after two years. Um, basically, the system of tribunals is a patronage thing, and in the words of Mary Jo, it's a, it's a crapshoot. The, the immigration system, the refugee, the vetting system, uh, aside from the security, is, is, needs some real overhaul. I would just like then to change the subject a little bit. Um, one of the speakers spoke to uh, the question of representation. Um, in an article in Warbus, uh, Andrew Coyne, who I think even Mr. Albrecht would agree is not a left-wing flake, uh, wrote a, a very poignant article on the fact that we talk about majority governments and we are in fact a minority government. The party in power for the last two years has, has only been, has not been supported by more than 55% of the population. Um, and if you count the people that are turned off and don't vote, it's even less. Our first past the post system, which we inherited from Westminster uh, in the UK, was designed for a two-party system. That is not the situation in Canada today. Um, you, uh, um, Bob, have already explained your party's position. I would ask the Liberal and the NDP representatives, are they interested in moving to some form of proportional representation which will more fairly reflect the wishes of the people of Canada? Because at the present time, the Conservatives are going to be far less than 50% of support. Thank you. Can we start with you, Ted, please? Absolutely. The simple answer is yes. We will change it. This, the Liberal platform is that this will be, if we form government, this will be the last first past the post system. Um, we're not saying that we want for, uh, proportional representation or preferential ballot. I don't think it should be up to one party to say what we will do. We've just said that we will sit down, watch this one across party lines, with everyone sit down and discuss, and within 18 months, by the next election, come up with a system that is not first past the post. It's going to take a little time to work out the bugs, but other countries, most countries in, I think, Europe are doing it. The world is not falling apart. It's, it's, you're not going to get the, the arguments about uh, uh, too, many, too many parties. It's, it works. It works and it's fair and it needs to get done. So all we've said is we're going to do, this will be the last first pass in post if we form government. Thank you. Bob, uh, your party is, you've already spoken for your party's position, James. No disrespect, I have different numbers than what you brought forward. Uh, in 2011, the Conservatives formed the majority government uh, with less than 40% of the yeah. popular vote. Uh, they don't want to fix our electoral system and hope to benefit once again from its flaws. Uh, all of this is leading more and more Canadians feeling left out of the political process. Uh, our low voter, voter turnout puts us in the bottom fifth of democracies, according to the OECD. Uh, and with respect to that, our plan, uh, Tom Mulcair is committed to making 2015 the last unfair election. Uh, the NDP will introduce a system of mixed member proportional representation during its first term in office, so within the first year, not 18 months. Uh, the NDP has a clear principle position. We want the Senate abolished. It is wrong to have this unelected, unaccounted body making laws for Canadians. Uh, we will repeal the Unfair Elections Act with the changes with respect to uh, the election cards that you receive in the mail actually don't hold much weight. Uh, we're committed to fixing the electoral system and make sure that no eligible voter is unfairly blocked from casting a ballot. Uh, and thanks to the NDP initiative, the House of Commons will soon be able to receive e-petitions. Thank you very much. I, I sort of thought Harold might like to say something. <laughs> so I'm to do that now. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to point out that the issue of uh, proportional representation has been raised at a number of different levels throughout the years. It's been raised in Ontario, it's been raised in British Columbia. There have been referenda held on this issue, and in, in each case, they've been turned down. For me, the bigger issue is uh, the issue of uh, party discipline. People say currently that the party has way too much discipline. 
Well, with a proportional representation uh, scheme, you actually have the party deciding who the MPs are. You vote according to party, the top 5, 10, 15, or whatever level of representation or votes you get. The party decides which one will be on the first, second, and third list. I had the privilege of observing an, an election in Moldova in November of this year. They have 22 parties' names on the ballot, 22 names on the ballot. And uh, they have a difficult, difficult time cobbling together a coalition that has any stability at all. So my preference at this point is to continue with the system we have. It's not perfect, but it's working well. And certainly, as I said earlier, uh, the issue of proportional representation has been put to referendum. And in each case, in, in Canada at least, in each case, it's been turned down soundly. Thank you. Jeff, very briefly, please. Um, stability is not an issue for proportional systems. In fact, Canada has had more elections since the Second World War than com uh, countries like Israel or uh, Italy, which are commonly cited as being unstable countries because of their proportional system. The only countries in uh, the industrialized world that don't have proportional systems are Canada, United Kingdom, Australia, and the United States. Um, and as you said, um, they tend to be two-party countries, um, and in fact, the first-past-the-post system tends to uh, diverge the party system into uh, a two-party system. Canada is very, very fortunate. We've got four people sitting here with the first-past-the-post system because that doesn't normally happen. Um, there is um, uh, another electoral debate on October the 3rd at Forest Heights uh, Community Centre. We'll all be uh, there as well, specifically to discuss the issue of electoral reform and proportion representation. So I hope you all come out to that if that's an issue of uh, importance to you. Thank you. Tim, please. I've got a question on the same uh, line. The uh, PMO has about 90 employees right now, uh, which tends to take all power away from our elected representatives. Um, Harold may disagree, but certainly as a taxpayer, that's what I see. Uh, all the parties require their uh, members to vote in line with uh, what their leader wants, and uh, that means we really don't have true elected representatives working for us. Uh, Mr. Harper appears to be that way. I've seen nothing different from Mr. Mulcair or Mr. Trudeau. So I would like your comments in terms of what can be done to give our elected representatives more power. Thank you. Uh, our attorney will start with, uh, with Bob, please. Glad to, glad if your leader doesn't have any trouble to, uh, delegating. <laughs> <laughs> One of the main electoral reform planks in the uh, Green Party's platform is to reduce the power of the uh, Prime Minister's office. Uh, it's not anywhere in the Constitution that there has to be one of those things. And the budget for that office has increased tenfold over the last 10, 15 years. Um, so certainly the idea behind uh, reducing the Prime Minister's office power is to reduce its budget as well, probably to uh, half of what it is today, which is about, um, I think, $5 million a year. I'm not sure of that exact figure, I've got it in front of me if, if you want me to look it up. And the other thing is that the Green Party respects its members. We, uh, we don't whip votes in the Green Party. Certainly there's only been two members of Parliament uh, that have had a chance to exercise their, uh, their free will. But as a member of Parliament, I am there to represent you not to pair it back the party line to uh, to you folks. Uh, I'm, I'm there to voice your concerns back to Parliament, not the other way around. Thank you. Uh, Tim, please. Uh, having all that power in the Prime Minister's office has led to extreme problems. I, I tried to read that book, Party of One, and I couldn't even get through it. I was so frustrated. And I'm running, so I'm doing as much as I can. Um, the fact that the Prime Minister's office is telling MPs what to do, the fact that our own elected officials do not have the power to, to govern and to represent us, is the, that's, that's why I'm running. It, government should run from the people up to, up, to, up to the government, not from the Prime Minister's office deciding what the whole country, what our, every policy we have. It's, it's, I almost feel bad for these guys. <laughs> Can I just follow up on that? Please. Because I've seen nothing from Mr. Trudeau that would suggest that he will give his uh, members any more power. Okay. He said you cannot run as a liberal if you're uh, not a uh, pro-choice. So I, I don't understand that's right. any different. No, Tim, you bring up a good point. Uh, Mr. Trudeau has said more free votes 
for all the MPs. There are just a few specific ones that have to do with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Other than a few specific situations, we're, we're going to have more free votes. That's, that's what he said. There's just a few. It has to do with the Quebec separation and women's uh, right to choose. Aaron, please. Yeah, thank you. I, I would like to challenge any one of you to go back to the voting records of the last 10 years and see which party's members have voted against the direction that was suggested to them by their leader and see which party comes out on top. I know for a fact the Conservative Party has by far, by far, the most independent votes on issues <laughs> where they have been encouraged to vote a certain way. We have freedom to vote, except on issues like the budget and the estimates, which we've got to work together on. We have our input in caucus, but when it comes to the budget and estimates, you've got to work together and, and move forward as a country. But on other issues, we have had the most freedom to vote our conscience. And I, I challenge anyone in this room to check the voting records, and I can, I can guarantee you, you will find that the Conservative Party comes out far ahead. And in comparison to uh, my colleague who says that they're going to have freedom, they don't have freedom to represent a certain point of view on the issue of abortion. They don't have freedom, for example, the senators. All the Liberal senators had no discussion. They were suddenly removed without any discussion or dialogue. That's a lot of power, in my opinion. So I think, I think, we, have to really, I think we, really have to, we really have to be careful when we're talking about which leader has given the most freedom to his and her members of Parliament. Uh, James, I don't think you've had a chance to. No, I haven't. <laughs> I've been watching the clock back there. And I, it's and moved just, quite a bit. <laughs> um, this will be the last item on that topic. I have to echo uh, Bob's comments on uh, the freedom to vote. Uh, if elected, I'm your voice in Ottawa. If you stand up against something, I stand behind you. I stand up against it. I've been doing it for my members for 16 years, and I'm not, I'm not new to standing up against those who are higher in authority than me and say, this is what they need. And I turn around and say, well, this is what they want. And this is what I'm going to give them because this is the direction they gave me. And with respect to going back and checking voting records, if you do, be very careful because you'll have to make sure that you check on first vote, second vote, third vote. Make sure you're not checking on voting to amendments or changes to the document that's been put forward because that's all in there as well and that's where a lot of the freedom comes where they can turn down or support changes to the documents. Okay, thank you. Nancy, yes. had a question? Yes. Um, I would like to hear from each of you in your discussion with your constituents from when the election was called. What is the most urgent issue that your constituents have told you about? Can we start with uh, Bob, please? I've been going around and I tend to gravitate towards the proportional representation, but the agencies that have approached me have overwhelmingly been concerned about poverty, social justice, and voters are very much concerned about their lack of representation in Parliament. Uh, the gentleman there was saying earlier, um, far worse than the numbers that he quoted, um, only about 24% of eligible voters voted Conservative, which means that over 75% of voters did not vote for that party, yet they've got the majority in Parliament. And that seems to be the overwhelming concern of most Canadians that I've spoken to in the area here. They want their representation, and they want to be well represented in Parliament, not by a small quarter of uh, the existing voting base. They want to have proportional representation. Harold, please. Thank you. I'm not sure I could give you one specific. I, I want one. Okay, if I had to choose one, it would be, it would be family support. F support for young families, that, the economy, and security. If I choose one, I haven't done a scientific study, but I would say support for young families. And could you say more about that? Okay, uh, supporting the continued uh, distribution of the universal child care benefit to families that have children under six, $160 per month for each child under six, $60 per month for each child from six to 18. And then the option for parents who may be earning different, uh, significantly different amounts to be able to share that income to reduce their tax burden. So support for young families. I'm a father of three, grandfather of nine, and I know how important it is for our young families to have a lower tax burden to be able to achieve their objectives. Jake Space. 
Picking one. There's there's a lot of different ones. I would have to say, and it, it plays a part on my family as well, uh, $15 a day, quality affordable daycare. Uh, Tom stands behind this. It's proven that it works in Quebec. Uh, we can prove that it will work in Canada. If you have that for a young family, uh, I have three sons and six grandchildren. Uh, the, the grandchildren, the mother has to stay at home because they simply can't afford the daycare so that she can go out and work and be productive and bring some income into the family. Uh, and I see the struggle. I mean, uh, my youngest son, his car breaks down, I have to go and help him out. Uh, it's, it's something that we believe in and it works every dollar. It shows between $1.63 to $2 goes back into the economy. Thank you. Tim Lewis, please. Um, at the door, people actually, some of the very programs that, that my colleague was mentioning is what they're complaining about, how it actually just favors the wealthiest Canadians. And that people who are struggling just to make ends meet, working really hard, are having a hard time. The cost of living is going up, and our wages are not and we're just getting dinged more and more. And it's that kind of frustration when people have to make a decision, am I saving for my retirement or my children's education? Uh, am I taking care of an aging population, my mother-in-law, or uh, you know, can we pay, which bills can we pay? It's that level of frustration, simple frustration that people are feeling that it's getting harder and harder that, that just makes me cringe. It shouldn't be that way. And that's, I'm very proud to say that the Liberal plan is to help those very people. Thank you. Do we get everybody? Yeah. Good. Bob Norman, please. Yes, I'm going to come back to an issue that's going to raise a couple of times. Uh, first by Jack Valetsi, I guess, I'm glad that you read at the very beginning. You know, if you look at the age of all of us in here, we've been around for elections for a long, long time. And so we've got a history of working how things have evolved over the, over the years. And, and one of the things that is starting to concern you, when you're retired, and you play golf with a bunch of people who are also retired, you've got lots of time to think about things that bother you. <laughs> and they become more and more bothersome as, uh, as time goes on. And one of the things that I, I have noticed, and the comment that was made before, is that our democracy seems to be in steep decline as a result of the strength of the PMO's office. Now, it didn't start, actually, with the conservative government. It started with the liberals, Pierre Trudeau, when he started to get more and more uh, power, I would say, in the prime minister's office. But, but in the past 10 years, instead of a, a slow decline, I've seen a precipitous decline in the participatory decision-making based on the best evidence that, that can be gathered. Uh, by this government, so a few examples, I've written them down because my memory's not so great, so I wrote them down. Uh, you know, I see the Muslim government scientists. And now, because I was a scientist, <laughs> as a scientist at the University of Waterloo, and I've recently I've maintained, maintained some contacts with the Retiree Association there, I see scientists at the University of Waterloo, particularly those working in the environment, are getting quite concerned about whether it's okay for them to publish or speak publicly uh, about the results of <coughs> the environment for fear of losing their uh, SSHRC or insert grants. That's, that's a dangerous thing. Uh, I, I saw, we all saw some time ago, the firing of a woman who refused to allow the restart of the nuclear reactor that made medical isotopes because there were some hazards. She was a nuclear expert. She wasn't a politician. She knew what she was talking about. She got fired. I see the closing of a world-class lake environment research facility near Kenora because the government didn't like what they were hearing from the results of the research. That's really why it was closed. It wasn't because of budget problems. Uh, I see, although it's been denied by Mr. Albrecht, they're requiring of backbenchers and even cabinet ministers to get clearance from the PMO before they can speak publicly or give interviews to the press. Um, I've seen interference with the audit of the Senate <coughs> by the Prime Minister's office. Major Wright comes to mind. I see a proroguing of Parliament. It looked like some kind of coalition between the Liberals and the NDP might 
might happen. So what's the, what do you do about that? You shut it down. Uh, I, re I see the, uh, the Prime Minister refusing to meet with the premiers of the provinces to discuss our medical care system. Now, Canada doesn't have a Canada-wide medical care system. The provincial systems, that's true. The money comes mainly from the feds. And if the prime minister isn't there discussing these things, we've got a big problem. Uh, I see the shabby treatment of the chief justice of the Supreme Court by the prime minister's office. <laughs> so my question, I guess it's aimed at Mr. Albrecht because you, you're there. Uh, in Parliament, is could, could you explain to me why I shouldn't be concerned? Oh, I can't. Uh, I can't tell you how you should feel, sir. But but I, I do see where you're coming from on many of the issues you've explained. But the experimental lake areas, for example, uh, has not been shut down. Oh, yeah. That's only because the problem oh, is you know, the experimental lakes area has been turned over to an international institute for sustainable development. It's still carrying on its research. The research is still being done. Our scientists have conducted thousands of interviews, 1,300 media interviews last year alone by Environment Canada scientists. Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada has published a thousand scientific publications. The stories that we're hearing about so-called muzzling, from my perspective as a member of Parliament backbencher, I have never been told not to do an interview or not to be at a debate. This is, this is folklore that a lot of media is projecting. I have never, ever been told not to con uh, conduct that kind of thing. I'm here today. I'm out at the door every day talking to individuals. I'm at hundreds of community events every year. I have the opportunity to interact with people all the time, as do my colleagues. So, with all due respect, uh, I defer in my opinion of what you're seeing and reading in the media. Any of the other folks like to say something? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I read a story with, about my colleague being locked in the kitchen, not being able to talk about stuff. Um, <laughs> I can't, I can't. I'm getting, I'm getting worked up here. Um, <laughs> no, you know, I guess you mentioned that you have, you're free to vote the way you want, so I imagine you agree with all of those things that Mr. Harper said. I don't understand how you could do that. Um, ideology should not trump evidence. It's as simple as that. And, and there's only one party that favors ideology above evidence. That's all I can say about this without getting too worked up. Mm -hmm. Exactly what uh, Tim was saying earlier. You know, um, we are at this end of the table are here because we can't sleep at night thinking about the very same concerns that you have when you're playing golf. Um, I would much rather be concerned while I'm playing golf. It seems like a far more pleasant way to be concerned than uh, lying in bed at night. But that's why we're all here at this side of the table is to make those changes so that those concerns can can be alleviated. It's going to take a lot of work to undo some of the damage that's been done, but I'm here to do that for you. James? My response to that is, I was glad that you singled out the Conservatives and the Liberals and you left the NDP out of it. <laughs> we, won't, we, won't, we will not muzzle our scientists, we won't fire our scientists. Our scientists play a valuable role in Canada. Uh, and the only other thing is, I want to go out for round of golf with you. <laughs> Sandy Travers, please. Um, I, I'd like to give my question to Tim, please. It's something that concerns me very much. Is Mr. Trudeau has stated that he'd like to legalize marijuana. And I'd like to know is that his intention? And I heard on CBC yesterday morning that um, he wants to run a deficit but he plans to pay it off with the profits that he makes from marijuana. No. <laughs> that's, that's not true. But but, um, 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 so, no, that. absolutely. Um, you know what, we just came out with our fully costed budget, which was, it, it's online, it's uh, 16 pages long, it makes complete sense. One of the things I was told is, yes, we will go with, if elected, we'll plan on legalizing and controlling, regulating marijuana. That is not in any way factored in the budget at all. It is not. We're expecting because you know, studies have shown uh, that when you're controlling it, basically it's like basically getting like getting rid of prohibition. Same we did with alcohol. But there's no way that we're going to we're not factoring in any way that money 
toward the budget. Well, my all. big concern is, are you going to legalize marijuana? Because I, I think. Yes. I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not a politician yet. I, can, I got these <laughs> short answers. Yes, we are. Um, right now, it's, 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 I got two teenage kids. It's easier for teenagers to get marijuana than it is for them to get a bottle of rye right now. And it needs to be controlled, it needs to be kept out of the hands of organized crime, which is making that money. It can be taxed, it can be controlled. Ignoring it's not a good idea, and the NDP of decriminalizing it still gets the money back to the criminal. So. Okay, Jerry Solomon, please. I've heard maybe one comment um, in the Green Party, I guess, about the environment. I would wonder if any of our candidates have read Naomi Klein's um, <clears throat> book called This Changes Things. Changes um, everything. I got the name wrong. But it's basically climate change versus capitalism. And it's a very well written book. If you haven't written, read it, I, I suggest that you do. And I would like to know what each candidate would do to stop the progression of our oil industry mm -hmm. that is tearing apart our world. And all of these other questions may be moot mm -hmm. if we don't do anything about it very soon. Well, let's start with change if we can. Thank you. Uh, in, the, in our NDP plan, uh, we will rise to meet our international climate change obligations through a transition to a clean economy. Uh, we will reduce Canada's reliance on fossil fuels. Uh, we'll support the energy efficiency and conservation. Uh, we will implement a cap and trade system that puts a price on carbon. Uh, so those who are producing pollution are going to be taxed on it, the large corporations. And we'll kickstart our clean energy sector to make Canada a global market leader. Uh, we'll eliminate the Conservatives' billion dollar subsidies to the fossil fuel industries and we'll restore Canada's international reputation on the environment. Uh, only Tom Mulcair and the NDP have committed to showing up at the climate meeting in Paris this November with climate change targets and a plan. Uh, as Environment Minister in Quebec, Tom Mulcair didn't just talk about climate change, he lowered emissions each and every year. Harold, thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. And I certainly am a, a, a great concern for our environment. I currently have the honor of chairing the Committee on Environment and Sustainable Development. And it's important that those two concepts are always held, held together. Under our government's leadership over these past 10 years, our greenhouse gases have, reduced, have been reduced by about 4% during a time of global, of, like, sorry, GDP growth of around 12%. So the GDP has increased, our production has increased, our greenhouse gases have dropped by almost 4%. In contrast to what they did during the previous government, which committed to stringent targets through Kyoto, uh, which, by the way, didn't address uh, pollution, it only addressed greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, during their tenure, the greenhouse gas emissions rose by over 30%. We have more work to do. Canada is responsible for less than 2% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. But that doesn't mean we don't do our part. But we have to encourage our international partners in all countries, including developing countries, to come to the table. In fact, our government has invested heavily in developing countries to help developing countries achieve their greenhouse gas emission reduction as well. Tim, please. Thank you, Harold. Uh, embarrassingly, Canada walked away from Kyoto. That, that was the beginning right there. Um, greenhouse gases were reduced because of something called a world recession. That's the only reason. And Canada has put all its eggs in one basket. They've just invested in oil. We have an opportunity to invest in green energy. We have an opportunity, and, and the part of the liberal platform, that big infrastructure platform they're talking about, one third of that is for public transit, one third of that is for social infrastructure, which is affordable housing, seniors' home, child care. One third of that is for environmental infrastructure. We have a chance to be a world leader in alternative energy, green energy, and investing in that and protecting our own water and protecting our own environment. So, uh, yeah, it's, we, we can do better. Also, we're going to bring every one of the, we're going to talk to the provinces to work together. Uh, and also, we're going to bring all of the premiers with us to Paris. So we come as one unit. And, and, and stand united as Canadians at different levels of government working together. Thank you, Tim. Bob, please. Sustainable development is such a wonderful oxymoron. <laughs> um, there is lots of industry available that is entirely environmentally 
sound. Um, infrastructure for, uh, for wind uh, development, hydro, uh, solar power, and even biogas. I fought against the biogas plant in Almaty, but the biogas process itself is perfectly sound. That industry combined can, um, can increase the industrial uh, capacity of Canada to exactly what, what's being, um, uh, what, what the fossil fuel extraction industry is, is giving to Canada today. So we can essentially bury the fossil fuel industry without causing uh, a major decline in Canada's industrial capability, uh, simply through shifting that over to sustainable industries. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. I just have one quick question back here in the end. With the writ being dropped and Parliament being dissolved, are you still chair of the environment? Or does that does that stop when I am still chair of the environment committee. The, the committee has not been called. Thank you. <laughs> I know it's your debate, I apologize. I just, I just, okay. Bill Johnson, please. Uh Bree Marijuana, the Liberal representative has a position that is understandable. I have yet to hear a cogent argument from anyone or any source as to why we would not legalize or decriminalize marijuana. Before I go home to have a drink, <laughs> can one of you who take that position provide that cogent argument? So the question is, why, why, would, why would you not support the the liberal policy of it's not necessarily specific to that policy, but the, why take a position that you will not do something about decriminalizing or legalizing uh, something that is inevitable? I'll start with James. Uh, Tom Mulcair has said that it will be decriminalized, but we won't legalize it and try and control it. When you do that, you do the same thing as you do with cigarettes in Canada. You build a huge underground market. You'll have the people that, that do use it, that are responsible with it, and then you'll have the kids who they can't sell it to, they still want it, they're gonna know where to get it. They know where to get it now. That's not gonna change anything. All it's gonna do is it's gonna make it okay for the people that openly wanna use it to purchase it, and to purchase it legally. But you'll still have It'll feed, still feed an underground market. Bob Jackman, please. Sorry, Bill, I, I can't give you an answer because I uh, agree that the criminalization of marijuana has not done anybody any favors. There is an underground economy for that today. And um, legalizing it and controlling it as a controlled substance, as alcohol and tobacco are today, um, is going to remove the underground economy, the underground criminalization of, of uh, the marijuana. So things will be better all around. Yes, there will certainly be a small portion of the population, the underage, the minors, who will be prevented from accessing that, just as it is with uh, cigarettes and alcohol. That isn't perfectly effective either, and I certainly don't expect that uh, marijuana will be perfectly controlled. Um, as opposed to what Mr. Lewis was saying, uh, the Green Party does intend to extract taxable revenue from uh, the legalization of marijuana. And if the existing underground economy is anything to go by, there is lots of money to be put into the Canadian tax coffers. We're, saying, we're not saying we're not going to extract it, we're saying we're not factoring it, we're not using that to rely on this is how we're going to pay for the budget, okay. not to scare people into right. thinking it's going to be, yeah, it's not in the budget, it's going to be... Not in the budget, yeah, that's right. Okay. Understood. Harold, please. Yeah, well, thank you again for that question. And, and many times today our colleagues have referred to uh, evidence-based decisions and there's increasing medical evidence shows the extreme risks of exposure to marijuana, especially in young people in their brain development. Excuse and there's, me, but is it in any way worse than alcohol? Oh, I'm, I'm not here to answer that question. No, but are there scientific studies that suggest it's worse than alcohol? I am suggesting that I would not favor the widening availability of any substance that would have the potential of decreasing the mental capabilities of our young people. We know that the marijuana that's produced today is much more potent than the marijuana that we had 20 years ago. We know that marijuana can be a gateway drug, and we know that marijuana has led to many, many cases of impaired driving, where people under the influence of marijuana have not been able to control. So to add to our current carnage uh, on the roads with impaired to, for drugs, I don't understand. We'll leave that to pass. Bill Barry has a question, and then uh, Mrs. Coffey. Uh, to echo a politician that is uh, 
has more regard than any of the politicians in Canada. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. We needn't fear immigrants coming into our country. Amen. We needn't fear people who want to criminalize or uh, control marijuana. What we have to do is have the willpower to do it. Nor should we give a short shift to people in Europe and Middle East that are suffering. And I want to ask each of you prospective candidates what you will do in the Kitchener-Conestoga area to facilitate refugees coming into our community. Um. Oh, please. Sure. Um, I had the privilege of uh, working at the Working Center in Kitchener for uh, almost three years. Um, it's a community organization that um, helps the lowest um, economically disadvantaged people uh, in the Kitchener area. Uh, they've got a housing first program at the moment, uh, something that they're uh, calling bunkies. Apparently, there's, there's obstructions to implementing this method of, of helping people settle in the area because there's no municipal legislation that addresses these small self-contained housing units uh, that people could live in. So in the, in the space of um, uh, an apartment that you know might uh, generally house only one or two families, the bunkies would actually be able to house uh, you know three or four um, uh, families instead of a, just one. So it's temporary short-term housing that can, that can certainly help an influx of, of people that need our assistance. Uh, the mechanisms for that exist. I have some experience with that, and I would certainly want to, uh, to broaden that in our local area. Thank you. Harold, please. Yes, well, thank you. We do have a number of agencies in the area who currently are helping refugees uh, settle in the area, and I applaud their work and fact, to partner with them as a government. Uh, my point that I made earlier in terms of being sure that we have the balance between accepting as many as we possibly can and help them integrate fully rather than simply just leave them to their to themselves is one that I think is, is critical. We need to have groups in the area who are willing to walk with them through those early transition months especially. So yeah, I, I personally, as I said earlier, I personally, my home and, and, our, and our, our church group has, has supported them. Uh, but to simply open the doors broadly to all of them at this point, I think, would be an irresponsible decision if we can't properly provide for them. At the doorsteps right now, I am hearing from immigrants, not refugees, who are saying, we came to Canada with all of these expectations, and now that we're here, you know, the expectations aren't being fulfilled. So I'm going to be sure that we're giving them a fair treatment once they're here. Thank you. Jim, please. At the door, those immigrants are wondering how they can't bring their family members in. That's what they're wondering. And it's increasingly difficult to do that. And at the door, when those immigrants become Canadian citizens, they're second-class citizens, and they're worried about it being taken away right away. Um, we can do more. Canada's proven to do more. We just need to just, just need to step it up. It, it's, what can you do here? Right here, you know what? There's a bunch of there's a bunch of church, a bunch of communities around here that are all raising money. They're trying to bring over immigrants. They're, they're having fundraisers. And then they run into the red tape. They run into the tape of, the, of, of these programs that are just making it increasingly difficult. And, and these, it's not working. We need to cooperate on the level with those churches, with the municipalities, with the provincial. Just everybody cooperate. Canadians want this. They want to bring people over. And they want to have a better life here and then give them a pathway to citizenship. Uh, as a Canadian, not a second class citizen. James, please. Uh, we do have a, a plan in place for that. There is funding. Uh, for getting immigrants into Canada. Also uh, bringing forward the uh, affordable housing programs. Uh, those, those transfers from the federal government are coming to an end. Uh, we will refurbish them. We'll make sure that the communities have affordable housing. Uh, my brother, uh, he has to live in affordable housing. He is dependent on uh, ODSP. Uh, he can't work. It just it, it doesn't work for him. Uh, so the, the affordable housing is a very viable option. Uh, we also have a plan put forward that will speed up the processing times and reduce black and backlogs. Uh, I've talked to people on the doorstep uh, where they have waited eight years to get their paperwork to become a Canadian citizen. And that was, I can't vote. I can't vote. I want to vote, but I can't vote. 
Uh, we'll give greater priority to family reunifications, especially to keep the children and the parents together. Uh, we'll create an immigration ombudsman to investigate problems and resolve complaints, and I think that's absolutely necessary with respect to what Tom was talking, or Tim was talking about. Uh, and we'll restore $30 million to the Foreign Credential Recognition Program that the Harper government promised and then failed to deliver. Thank you. Uh, Adrian Bass, please. Yes, I have a question regarding, you probably heard a lot about the F-35, which I understand uh, has a fair amount of money involved. <coughs> I've heard from the service what they want to do with it. I believe if you want to hold on to it. I heard from the Liberals that they would like to renegotiate. Um, I've also looked at the U-boats that we bought from England that have most people in the dry dock. Those of those. I haven't heard anything from the NDP. Uh, what they want to do with this contract that we have for the F-35, which my understanding is is basically a blue dog, but that beside the point, can I get your opinion on what more Chairman would like to do with the F-35? He understands that cancelling that program and switching to another manufacturer or to a less, I'd say, I, I, don't, I don't want to use the word cheaper, I'm, I'm sure that that was the word that I heard in the news, uh, but Abandoning a plan that's already put forward like that, uh, the penalties involved, I'm in a construction trade and I know that the penalties involved would be far greater than the benefits you save by going to a cheaper aircraft for our military. And I believe that, that Tom has not said anything about cancelling that program, so it would carry forward. I guess I'm the only one that gets to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm very conscious of the time, and I think that there's a couple of other issues that uh, we might want to get at, and I'll see if, if Ken has one of those. Hey, I want to go ahead this question. How will the refugees affect our health care and what type of jobs do we have for these people that are coming into this country? Well, who would like to start with that? Uh, initially, it's going to cost to bring in refugees. These people are going to need assistance, they're going to need housing, they're going to need health care. And that will cost probably for the first 18 months, two years, maybe three years. But these people will settle. Uh, the idea is to have them become Canadian citizens, to become productive members of society. And for the most part, the people who are fleeing those countries are in the prime of their life. They have a long future ahead of them. And so they will become productive citizens. And the investment that's made in, in refugee settlement and refugee acceptance today will come back and, and pay for itself in um, additional uh, workforce, additional tax revenue, uh, just a better citizen base, probably in, in the course of, of 5, 10, 15 years after they've uh, settled here. It's a long-term view, and I tend to believe that um, politicians don't think much further than the next election, but that's certainly a long-term view that we need to take. Is that going to be a burden on our health care? Because we do have in the tough times now. There are a lot of burdens on health care today, and there are many plans to reduce that burden. Uh, probably the biggest one the Green Party is proposing is the guaranteed livable income. Having people able to purchase healthy food, uh, having a good roof over their heads, reduces the <coughs> needs that they need, uh, or the demands that they need to make on health care. So providing that to the refugees as well um, is going to reduce their health care needs right away. I mean, it's, it's, uh, people are coming in probably undernourished and, and, um, and not as well as they might be. Yes, there's going to be a, a, an influx of, of additional health care that's needed. Over time, that will reduce and it will be a, a, a net benefit to Canada. Other folks have anything to say? Um, Just simply, a lack of transfer payments from the federal to the province, that's got probably a bigger bigger damage to uh, to the healthcare system right now than, than the fact that we might bring over some refugees and, and, and they're costing too much. I, I don't think that's, that's, that's the issue. Well, just, just on that point, this doesn't directly address this other question, but on the transfers of the problem <coughs> for healthcare, the transfers have increased 6% every year over the last 10 years, and we're committed to increasing that by at least 3%, or the cost of living increase, whichever is greater, over the next uh, future. So to imply that there's health cuts is, is not, not fair. Okay. James? Really quickly, uh, immigration does help grow our economy. Uh, it fosters innovation. It increases trade. 
Uh, more than that, it's a part of who we are as a country, as Canada. Uh, our obligation to these people, when we open up our arms and we take them in, as, as unfortunate as some people may find it, we have that obligation to take care of them. If they come in as Canadian, they get treated like every other Canadian. Unfortunately, that's the way we are. Uh, one of the other things, the hampering things for them are credential recognition. If we have people coming in from other countries, and let's say, like myself, they're a tradesperson in their country, they're either a millwright, or a mechanic, or they're a sheet metal worker, or they do refrigeration, when they come into Canada, their credentials are not recognized. So they cannot go and get a job right away in the field that they've been trained for in their own country. They have to go through the whole process of proving themselves starting at the bottom. An NDP plan will reverse that and we'll start to recognize their credentials so that we can get them out there faster working and putting their money into our economy to help build Canada. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very conscious of the time and of the fact that these folks have been probably at this since about 7.30 this morning and <laughs> yesterday and all of the days before that. So what I'd like to uh, do now is ask them to each take one and a half minutes. And if you're wondering who the noisy person at the front here is, the, it's our, it, it's our uh, time czar, Susan Sutherland, and we appreciate the job you're doing. But the timer I gave her doesn't, doesn't handle 30, well, you have to get it 90 times to get a minute. <laughs> so do your best, Susan. Uh, and we'll, re <laughs> we'll reverse the order if we may. Um, and we will start. So this is your recap, your last crack at us. But you folks will have an opportunity to speak with them at the little stations they have set up outside. So if you didn't get a particular question answered, please feel free to address it to them. They, they said they would stay for a while uh, after the session. So let's begin then with uh, James Villeneuve, please. I want to thank you for your time today. I want to thank you for your patience. Your questions were actually nowhere near what I thought we were going to get for questions, which is amazing. On October 19th, you have an important decision to make. And it is important. And a lot of people at the doors are saying they're not going to vote. In a room like this, I appreciate the fact that I know that everybody is going to cast their ballot on that day. And they're going to make a choice for Canada. They're going to make a choice for themselves. When you cast your ballot, all I ask is you think of my story of my mom, and you think of your story. And if your stories match, you can bring change. Thank you. Uh, number two, Tim Lewis. Tim. This election is actually going to be a very clear choice. Uh, our party has said we're going to do smart investments that create jobs and growth, or there's other option of austerity and cuts that's going to slow our economy down right now. Um, and I think that the Liberal Party is investing in our future. We're thinking long term, not just about this next election cycle. Um, we've got a real plan that's focused on the middle class, getting more money to families to help them raise their children and restoring transparency in government while fighting climate change. You can, you can work on the economy and the environment at the same time. It is actually possible. And after a decade of Mr. Harper's conservatives, Canadians' faith, uh, faith in government has never been lower. Um, and I, well, I had this stuff written down, but you got me already, Bob. A government that muscles scientists, dismisses veterans, ignores our native and aboriginal population, disregards the environment, uh, my list is long, but I'm running out of time. But we have a clear choice on election day. I believe that conservatives have had their chance, and I believe that the liberals are ready to lead, and it's our time for a real change right now. Thank you. Thank you. Harold, please. Well, thank you again for organizing this event and for being here today and for your great questions. Uh, I've had the privilege of representing you for the past 10 years, and I've uh, represented you on areas like infrastructure investment in our area here in Fisher Conestogo. So whether it's a woman rec complex, or a bridge construction or road construction, uh, the new trails that we've just invested in or the St. Agatha Community Center. Uh, I've also had the honor and privilege of championing some causes in Parliament that are close to me. Suicide prevention, mental health initiatives, palliative care, organ donation. Uh, these have been areas that I've focused on over the past that number of years. My office has had the privilege of serving you on issues like employment insurance, Canada Pension Plan, passports, uh, multiple immigration issues, multiple issues that 
you as constituents have come to my office for and I'm indebted to my staff for the great work they've done on that. I've had the privilege of hosting some significant events, seniors roundtables, shredding parties where we can bring our uh, sensitive documents that we don't want to get into the wrong hands to be shred. Uh, new citizen welcomes. I've welcomed many, well, I've attended at least 100 new citizen ceremonies and to, to watch new citizens uh, take that oath of citizenship, there is nothing like it. And then to welcome them into my office for a little party about every three months we have uh, the new citizens come out there to, to meet each other. Uh, community events, multicultural events, uh, Canada Day, the fairs, fall fairs in the area, where I've had the opportunity to interact with many of you there. Finally, my strong commitment is to continue the work we're doing in supporting young families, uh, to continue to keep our budget balanced and to pay down our debt, and to continue to ensure Canadians are secure at home and abroad. Thank you. On October 19, I welcome your support. Thank you. Finally, Bob Chapman. An hour and a half goes by so quickly. Um, there's been some very good questions from the room here today and a whole bunch of questions that we didn't get to. And I wish we had another hour and a half to spend together. Um, a lot of the things that uh, Mr. Albrecht just covered, um, issues that are uh, of a concern to me too. And Mr. Albrecht has done a reasonably good job locally for that. But it's the country that's at stake here. So I, I urge you to consider um, what it is that you want for Canada. But most importantly, how can that representation best come to you? And I, I'm very annoyed that this election is still going to be a first-past-the-post election, that you don't get the representation in Parliament that you deserve. If you're considering strategic voting, keep in mind what happened at the last election. There were two large initiatives across Canada, one called the Vote Pair for Vote Swapping and one called Catch-22 for Cooperative Voting. Neither of them worked. Strategic voting does not work. You want to vote for the candidate who will best represent you. People say that the Green Party can't get elected. Well, the reason the Green Party isn't getting elected is because people aren't voting for them. You can change that. So on October 19th, I urge you to vote for the candidate who will best represent you. I hope that's a Green person. That would be me. <laughs> vote. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're grateful for the uh, candidates who take the time to come and spend with us this afternoon, who, who gave us their opinions on so many things and heard our thoughts, which I think is important. Thank you very much.